evening. I hope you're all enjoying your dinner and the very lively conversations that I've been hearing. It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Zhang Wang. Professor Wang is the Mizuho Financial Group Professor of Finance at Sloan. He holds a PhD from the Wharton School and also a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Pennsylvania, which makes him the envy of every economist here. <laughs> Professor Wang's research focuses on the pricing of financial assets and on risk management. He's currently working on a variety of great issues um, relevant to financial policy, on high frequency trading and market efficiency, optimal intervention policy during liquidity crises, optimal portfolio execution, systemic risk, and market liquidity. Um, and as those of you know who have studied his papers, Professor Wang's research has an exceptional elegance, depth, and respect for empirical facts that's really giving it a very long-lasting relevance. Um, I know I've learned a lot from it. Um, but actually, we've invited Professor Wang here tonight um, to speak on another topic where he's also a leading expert, and that's on the financial development and capital markets in China. As I was preparing these remarks, I was reminded of conversations I had with him probably 25 years ago now when we were both assistant professors about his parents' experiences in China during the Cultural Revolution. I bet he remembers those conversations too. And I remember how impressed I was by how he thought about those circumstances and the nuance in general and his thinking about what went on in China in the past and now. And I have to say that over the years, I've learned an enormous amount from him on that topic. In any case, there's probably nowhere else in the world where financial policies and institutions run by governments have a more profound influence on economic well-being than in China. And this period of generally increasing financial opening is an opportunity for Chinese policymakers to get it right. Professor Wang is doing a lot to make that happen. Um, and he's doing that in a number of important ways. Um, but just to highlight one thing that I think is especially notable, um, he's made enormous contributions to the financial education of the Chinese students who will be the leaders in the future in China, both through his leadership of the Masters of Finance program here at Sloan and through the guidance that he's been giving to institutions in China like the Shanghai Advanced Institute for Finance and Tsinghua University. Um, so with all of that, please join me in wel welcoming Professor Wang. Thanks, Debbie, for that uh, generous uh, <coughs> introduction. Um, actually, I brought a few slides. I wonder if, uh, I think, you know, Debbie actually uh, asked me to <clears throat> uh, say a few things about, uh, first, you know, the financial development in China in uh, recent years and also uh, the role that actually the government plays, both in terms of actually um, <clears throat> roll out various reforms uh, as well as um, some of the trade-offs actually the like government faces. Um, exactly as Debbie said, um, I guess in the U.S., you sort of have to look at least before the uh, the financial crisis somehow, so somehow to see uh, the 
important roles that our government plays, not just in terms of setting up the rules, but also in terms of participating uh, in the market in, in various ways. Uh, but in China, uh, you know, government still is very much the dominating uh, force. Um, so many of the developments that we see uh, are mostly driven by the government as well as uh, heavily controlled, intervened by the government. <clears throat> so actually, I would like to start by uh, mentioning a few data. I don't know if actually. Um, <clears throat> so certainly, uh, it's, we all know that uh, during the last uh, several decades, uh, China has uh, experienced a very fast growth, um, <clears throat> both in terms of uh, its uh, GDP uh, as well as in terms of uh, international trade and uh, foreign reserve, uh, which could be used as a measure of uh, its economic scale. <clears throat> and uh, if we also to compare that with uh, other countries, uh, certainly it's, uh, it's reached the scale, uh, that's uh, quite substantial. Uh, if you look at the GDP, it's the second largest. Uh, actually, if you look at the trade, uh, depending on what numbers you look at, actually it's comparable to the US. Sometimes uh, certain years is bigger. Um, certainly it's enjoyed a substantial trade surplus. <clears throat> now, of course, it should be noted that uh, China has a huge population. Uh, I guess as one Chinese leader once said, that uh, for any achievement uh, in China, if you divide by the population, it uh, becomes very, very small. Uh, and for any problem, if, if you multiply that by the population, uh, no matter how small that uh, problem is, it becomes very large. <clears throat> So certainly on per capita basis, uh, China is still very much a developing country. Um, going forward, of course, uh, it very much depends on what the perspective is. Uh, if you think actually you could uh, reach a fraction of the level of the developed countries so far, certainly uh, it will have a huge room to grow. But of course, uh, it's possible that actually its growth may slow down, as certainly we have seen um, in the recent um, growth in its uh, GDP, if uh, that is the measure that we're going to be using. Um, through this actually process, uh, the Chinese financial system certainly has actually developed quite a bit. <clears throat> and here's some uh, simple measures. Um, if we actually look at you know different sectors of the financial system, uh, it's notable that actually the banking sector is still the dominating one. The total bank credit extended by commercial banks is at the level of 15 trillion U.S. dollars. That's quite a bit uh, than uh, even the U.S. <clears throat> Uh, the stock market, which I'll comment a little bit on later, uh, has grown quite a bit, actually. Uh, it started in 1990, uh, in the past roughly about 25 years ago or so. Uh, it's become the second largest in terms of total market cap. Uh, the fixed income market actually uh, has grown quite a bit. Uh, I will show uh, some more details. <clears throat> but certainly in some other areas, um, the growth uh, is a lot slower. For example, if you look at actually the size of uh, assets on the, uh, the management of investment companies, uh, it's about 11% of the, uh, the GDP Y for the US, it's 100%. And this fact actually often has been uh, cited to, to try to understand some of the, uh, the behavior in uh, Chinese uh, capital markets. Uh, I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. <clears throat> but if you were to sort of the U use the US as a reference point, uh, clearly, um, both in terms of size, not to mention quality, uh, China has still uh, quite a bit of room to, to grow. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, looking uh, in a little more detail uh, the part of capital markets. Uh, certainly, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, it is next to the U.S., uh, larger than most of the other developed markets. Okay. <clears throat> Although, uh, if you were to compare that with the size of the economy, uh, there's still uh, quite a bit of room to grow. Um, so in terms of uh, the uh, openness, um, China certainly opened the, uh, the trade first. Uh, the opening of its financial system actually has been uh, quite slow. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but nonetheless, uh, in recent years, actually has experienced quite a fast growth. Uh, the total uh, foreign direct investment uh, last year actually has reached um, the, uh, this is actually sort of 1.2 trillion uh, in US dollars. So I'd probably be somewhat switching back and forth between uh, dollars and uh, IMB. 
And if you compare that with the US, uh, if you use uh, historic cost, uh, the total uh, FDI is about 5.6 trillion. So this is actually you know, quite scalable. Uh, also on annual basis, last a couple of years, because of the opening of the capital account, um, the annual uh, net foreign direct investments reached a level of you know, 200, 250 billion dollars, which is actually quite comparable to the current US level. <clears throat> Uh, I guess all these uh, numbers seem to suggest, actually, uh, over a fairly short period of time, uh, China has really uh, developed uh, quite a bit, not just in terms of the total size of the economy, but also in terms of its uh, financial system. Uh, I would actually, instead of you know, covering uh, sort of every aspect of the, uh, the financial system, I would actually, going forward, just focus on a few areas and uh, a few examples. <clears throat> But actually, if you follow the financial development there, uh, at least with some casual observations, um, <clears throat> uh, you will probably notice the following. Uh, certainly, in terms of the achievement so far, it's been very impressive. And in certain areas, uh, the progress is uh, fairly fast. I'll probably mention, let's say, um, uh, mobile uh, payment uh, development. Uh, it's, uh, in many ways, probably the most advanced in the world. However, uh, it, uh, it's also uh, <laughs> quite obvious that actually development um, often lacks a clear goal. Uh, <clears throat> this is not just in terms of the actual development we see, even in terms of uh, the objectives or the goals the government articulate. Okay? And uh, uh, one thing it's actually, uh, we'll see examples of that, uh, it's quite uh, not obvious, is whether or not uh, China really would like to develop itself into a market-based economy, including financial markets, or use it, these markets, including financial markets, just as tools to achieve certain policy or economic, economic objectives. <clears throat> and uh, as you know, we've seen from the data already, the development is quite uneven uh, across different areas. In certain areas, actually, it's developed fairly fast. In some areas, uh, it's still uh, way behind. Uh, the pace of the progress is also not very consistent. You will see three steps forward and then two steps back. Uh, maybe that's partially related to the fact that actually the goals are not quite straightforward. And sometimes when certain reforms are rolled out, uh, you will see quite unanticipated outcomes, which would uh, push the government to slow down uh, the, the reforms and actually maybe take backward uh, measures. And uh, you know, despite the, uh, the fast development, uh, it should be noted, actually, uh, we still see uh, some major uh, distortions. I'll just mention a few. <clears throat> uh, one is actually uh, the government is very much behind almost most of the major financial activities. So this issue of government uh, implicit guarantee and sometimes direct interventions uh, is really a very important part of uh, the Chinese financial system. Many prices were still kind of controlled, either explicitly or implicitly, uh, by the government. I will mention two. One is the interest rate, the other would be the stock price. Uh, many markets are very much missing. A good example of that would be the derivatives market. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on that. Uh, and here it's actually um, a fairly uh, mature, mature set of uh, instruments and the markets, and yet um, uh, if you look at the size and the variety uh, in China, it's very, uh, very much limited. And uh, the other part I think that's quite uh, uh, stalking is that actually China, in terms of trade um, and so on, it's been fairly well integrated into the global economic system. And yet, on the finance side, it's very much closed uh, from the global financial system. Okay. And this certainly uh, caused uh, various uh, distortions. <clears throat> and uh, on top of that, actually, uh, many uh, fundamental uh, reforms, uh, in my view, actually has yet to come. Uh, for example, you know, what are the boundaries between the government and, uh, and markets and firms? Uh, how do we actually define property rights or enforce them, uh, the legal system uh, in general, uh, not to mention the ones relevant for economic and financial development, uh, very much in its sort of early uh, development stage. Uh, all of these actually would have fairly uh, fundamental implications on actually the financial uh, development. 
Uh, <clears throat> so what actually I think uh, uh, I would like to do is actually to look at sort of three areas um, which uh, are important uh, for you know, the development of any financial system and certainly for China's. <clears throat> and probably focus on the first two, uh, banking for obvious reasons, because this is still the dominating part of the Chinese financial system. And then I'll focus a little bit on, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, capital market. Um, and this is where actually I've done some research. And uh, if time permits, I'll make a few comments on the globalization part of the Chinese uh, financial system. Um, <clears throat> so on the banking side, um, China actually has gone a long way. You know, before um, 1976, uh, the whole country is really under the so-called planned economy system. Uh, there wasn't much of a banking system to speak of. Uh, you know, really, that's just a place you, you deposit with whatever interest rate there might be. Um, <clears throat> and it's mostly used as uh, a way to make transactions. Um, but of course, uh, as uh, China tries to develop a, a more uh, market-oriented economy, uh, you know, the uh, well-functioning of the banking system becomes quite important uh, to extend credit to uh, firms, uh, <clears throat> and actually the credit for consumers is, uh, is much la uh, later. So uh, the uh, a critical uh, reform is actually to commercialize, so to speak, uh, the, uh, the central bank. Um, uh, so in 84, four commercial banks commercial only in the sense that actually now, instead of acting as branches of, you know, different branches of the central bank, of the People's Bank, um, <clears throat> these banks were spun off with um, direct focus on different sectors of the economy, uh, extending credit to firms, primarily uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, and also uh, in that year, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the first issuance of uh, some stock shares uh, in its very primitive form and uh, enterprise bonds were uh, issued, for basically used as other ways, hopefully, for uh, the firms to raise, uh, raise capital. <clears throat> and 86, actually, uh, the first uh, stock share bank was established, uh, where the stock share bank means that actually it's not directly uh, controlled by a government, but with different entities uh, pitching in as uh, investors or as shareholders. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so if you look at the four largest uh, state-owned uh, banks plus the 12, uh, that's the current number, uh, that's a total of 16 banks. Um, <clears throat> and um, in late 90s, uh, started actually in 95, uh, it actually allowed uh, cities, uh, local governments, to uh, you know, to start their own banks uh, with the uh, objective to actually opening up uh, the banking sector, hopefully introduce uh, more competition. And uh, along this process, actually a couple of other important uh, developments. One is actually in 2013, uh, the bank lending rates were quote unquote liberalized. Uh, before that, all the borrowing and lending rates uh, from the banks are set by the central government. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in 2015, uh, the deposit rates were sort of liberalized. Uh, at the same time, um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the uh, arrangement of, uh, of deposit insurance was also uh, introduced. Um, this actually is further trying to pull the government away uh, as you know, guarantors of these banks and hopefully to have a more market-driven mechanism driving the uh, business of these uh, large banks. So I guess the you know, uh, overall development of this is really actually try to uh, vitalize uh, the uh, banking system, hopefully uh, introduce some market forces to drive them to um, extend you know, credit uh, to firms that actually uh, have you know, good investment opportunities. <clears throat> And to some extent, actually, that's you know being um, successful. Uh, although uh, it's also created you know various other uh, problems. Um, so actually, let me uh, sh you know use this to um, show um, so what's happened uh, over these uh, 15 years or so. So the bars actually are basically showing the total assets of the banks. 
The blue ones are basically total assets of these four largest banks. Uh, they are still dominating forces, and actually, if you look at the share structure, they're still mostly owned by the central government, uh, despite the fact that actually, you know, all of them are actually listed abroad uh, with shares traded on uh, <clears throat> in Hong Kong or other places. The, the red part actually gives us the contribution from these uh, 12 joint stock uh, banks. Okay. They're sort of, you know, uh, half uh, private, although actually many of the shareholders are still uh, different forms of government entities. The green line actually uh, represents uh, the so-called the city banks. <clears throat> And I think that uh, this actually is one of the uh, major reforms in the banking sector uh, driven by the following uh, considerations. With these a few large uh, banks um, pretty much sitting on the huge uh, interest rate sp uh, spread actually in this um, next um, <clears throat> chart I will show. So this actually is the history of, this is the, uh, uh, the lending rate, uh, the banks Make, and mostly to state-owned enterprises. A lot of them do have also government guarantee implicit. And the blue ones are deposit rates. So if you look at the difference here, it's roughly 3.5 percentage point. Okay. So for all these banks, uh, they don't have to do anything to make a lot of money because all they have to do is try to uh, expand the deposits. So of course, as the economy grows, uh, that base is increasing. And all they have to do is actually to um, enjoy that uh, interest rate spread. So they are not really extending credit uh, to, you know, let's say, uh, private companies who do have uh, good growth opportunities. <clears throat> and uh, they are not doing a lot of lending uh, to local communities, uh, to uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. So uh, <clears throat> one way to try to break that is actually to allow these city banks, so different cities uh, can actually now uh, get license to uh, start their, uh, their own banks. <clears throat> and the objective originally was stated that actually you'll be lending to the uh, you know, local companies, to small and medium enterprise companies, and also to uh, local communities. And you know, it started from 2002, and you can see this is the, the line. It gives us the, the uh, numbers, and uh, very uh, quickly reached a level of you know, 140 or so. But what actually happened is that instead of actually uh, lending you know, money to um, local communities or um, uh, you know, local uh, companies, uh, what they did is actually end up opening up branches everywhere. In other words, they're basically playing the same game as these large banks. So you would see, let's say, Bank of Nanjing, which is you know, a city in the province I uh, grew up with, you will see their branches everywhere in Shanghai, in, in Beijing. Basically, all they have to do is try to cut into the, uh, the same business model that actually uh, these large uh, state-owned banks uh, are really doing. <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, this uh, is not really a, a, a sustainable model. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and as you, we can see, that actually as uh, you know, the competition uh, uh, increases, uh, what's plotted on the right-hand side is actually the return on assets. Uh, we certainly see a declining in their returns um, <clears throat> uh, quite uh, substantially uh, since um, 2013. And then, you know, uh, so in some sense, you know, that was actually seems to be a, a good move with, you know, good intentions, but it didn't quite uh, play out uh, <clears throat> completely the way it was intended. Uh, on top of that, you know, the overall uh, asset base for the banks actually have uh, increased uh, and the uh, uh, return uh, on assets actually decreased. And actually, you know, the government is trying to also impose certain restrictions on the fast pace of uh, credit expansion. <clears throat> by the way, part of that, especially after the financial crisis, was actually driven by the uh, huge stimulus uh, measures that actually the Chinese government uh, instituted. <clears throat> And actually, many of these credit expansions were not uh, sound ones. So uh, over time, certainly, uh, they show uh, the, uh, the costs. <clears throat> um, and of course, with the so-called liberalization of the, uh, the deposit uh, rates and uh, lending rates, uh, the idea is hope that actually the market forces will be uh, playing a bigger role. Uh, 
toward the very right, you will see the max and min uh, deposit rates um, since the full liberalization. There's not much really of a spread. Um, so uh, most of these banks more or less still follow sort of uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the government's uh, benchmark rates, despite the fact that actually they could set their own. So another uh, interesting uh, phenomena during, uh, through this process, uh, as banks actually trying to uh, adjust to uh, changes in the interest rates um, <clears throat> and also a more competitive landscape is actually for them to uh, act as a, a retail end for what's called the wealth management products. Okay? So this is, describes the total amount of wealth management product sold through the banks. They are not products issued by the banks. Uh, banks can't quite do that. They actually products issued by you know, security firms, uh, trust companies, and so on, but they actually were sold through the banks. Now, if you buy any one of these uh, wealth product uh, management products, it would say that you know, there's a lot of risk, and the banks have nothing to do with that. We're just selling them. Uh, we don't provide any guarantees. And yet, <laughs> they actually, uh, they're sold through the banks. And uh, of course, the reason is that there is a clear, at least from the investor perspective, there's a clear uh, some kind of a government guarantee uh, behind it. <clears throat> and of course, uh, this uh, generates a lot of uh, fees for the banks uh, and sitting as off balance sheet uh, items on the banks. So uh, this is another example actually with at least the perception of uh, the uh, implicit guarantee by the banks and probably backed by the government, um, <clears throat> you will see um, this boom in the so-called wealth management uh, products. And the blue bars show the ones that actually the principles are guaranteed. Uh, the red ones actually showing that actually the principle is not guaranteed, um, although we have yet to see um, you know, any one of these uh, going through the major banks uh, to go through an actual default, despite actually the fact that a lot of these wealth man management products uh, guarantee very high returns, you know, six, eight, seven percentage point, quite a few point uh, above actually the current um, <clears throat> borrowing and lending rate for similar maturities. Um, so I guess, you know, using these two examples, what I'm trying to show is that actually, uh, despite the reforms in the uh, banking sector, uh, some of the, uh, the issues remain there. These uh, state-owned banks are still fairly uh, uh, fat and uh, you know, unresponsive, uh, actually are not really doing as much as they could have in terms of actually providing uh, the much needed uh, funding for uh, private enterprises, private firms, or small and medium term uh, <clears throat> firms, as well as actually consumers. So uh, the, the Chinese government actually has also tried, you know, take some um, sort of unusual measures to try to actually get around the existing banking system. So actually, I want to mention two uh, examples. One is actually this, uh, the mobile, uh, the growth in the sort of uh, mobile payment uh, landscape. And uh, if you go back five years, actually, I you know, travel two or three trips, um, go to China. Each time after I check into the hotel, I would have to go to the a cash machine to try to get some cash because everything has to be paid in cash. And you need a pretty big wallet to catch, to catch a few thousand dollars, <laughs> IMBs. Uh, <clears throat> so it's such a pain in the neck. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, banks charge all kinds of fees just to sort of put in your cash or get your cash out. <clears throat> and that was uh, very inefficient. And then uh, <clears throat> what actually happened is that actually as the mobile phones became so popular, um, the, uh, the mobile payment system uh, really took off. Okay? Uh, for example, by the end of uh, last year, the total transaction volume um, succeeded, you know, $2.8 trillion. I'm using actually a very conservative uh, number here, as you know. I probably should also mention that as anything with China numbers, you know, actually how accurate they are. There's always some, uh, some question there. Um, and, uh, you know, some numbers, uh, some surveys actually would give this a uh, uh, much higher number <clears throat> of the order of five trillion dollars or even more. <clears throat> but this, uh, at this point, actually has already exceeded um, the amount of cash that's taken out through uh, ATMs or, or bank cards. 
Um, so in that sense, actually, it's really taking over uh, cash as uh, a main means of, uh, <coughs> of uh, uh, payments. Right? Um, so uh, this uh, is actually uh, uh, quite an interesting development. It certainly actually uh, took away a, a, a big source of uh, revenue from, uh, or profit from banks. Uh, certainly actually make uh, transactions a lot more uh, efficient. And uh, the other uh, example <coughs> I want to mention is um, this uh, sort of example of uh, uh, mobile banking. Um, this actually is really uh, what you can view as a, a money market uh, a fund uh, run by actually the what's called the Ant Financial, which is uh, a spun-off entity uh, from uh, Alibaba. Okay. So uh, what actually uh, happened here is actually for people to use the mobile payment, you need to first deposit some money you know, uh, with uh, uh, these uh, payment companies. And uh, what these third party, party payment uh, companies try to do is actually to put the money uh, into uh, the money market. So now actually you can earn interest on that. <clears throat> so this, uh, started actually um, in 2014 uh, and uh, <clears throat> in a partnership with um, a mutual fund company. Uh, this mutual fund company actually in 2013 is nowhere to be found on uh, any of the rankings. In that one year, it became the number one mutual fund uh, in China. Uh, <clears throat> actually, at that time, was sitting on a board uh, of a you know a mutual fund, uh, which for years has been ranked you know like among the top ten, and at a year, the ranking just changed. I asked it, what happened? Well, <laughs> this this new fund who just in one year uh, jumped into this. Um, by the end of last year, actually, the total size of this <clears throat> is actually uh, over two hundred billion dollars. Uh, I guess you know if you to compare that with the largest. Uh, money market fund in the U.S. So I guess I don't know which one. Depends on which one you look at. If you look at Fidelity, I, last time I checked, it's a little bit below 100. Uh, and uh, I guess J.P. Morgan has a fairly large one uh, around uh, 100. I don't know about <laughs> BlackRock, but uh, certainly you know this actually is uh, quite uh, tremendous. And this really, uh, it's called a money market fund, um, but it's really like a bank, and yet it's not regulated uh, as a bank at all. Uh, so the government. Uh, basically, you know, allow uh, the online companies uh, to do something like this. And uh, so what you can see is that what's shown, the blue line, is actually uh, the interest rate, current interest rate on uh, demand deposits, practically zero, or very low. Right? And then this actually is basically uh, <clears throat> the independent market that actually um, this fund can uh, lend in and also can pay the investors for. And so if you look at the spread, it's basically two to three basis point. And of course, this uh, became very attractive to, uh, <clears throat> to individuals and households. So it's quite interesting to actually try to, you know, sort of the, to break the uh, gridlock of the existing banking system. The government actually was allowed uh, developments like this, which were quite, uh, quite unusual. Uh, and of course, uh, when you get to um, <clears throat> such a scale, uh, the government also get a little scared. Uh, for example, just in this year, for the, <clears throat> the mobile payment, uh, the People's Bank just rolled out the regulation that all the third party payments would have to go through a centralized uh, clearing system. Uh, so actually, it's not quite as third party anymore. Um, and then for this um, money market fund, uh, the, it's also just very recently, uh, the, <clears throat> the central bank rolled out the regulation that actually for the new accounts, um, the total balance cannot exceed 100,000 IMB. So in other words, actually, it's trying to curb the growth of these funds. Of course, uh, there are good reasons uh, for that. Uh, for example, uh, what are the inherent you know, systemic risk in systems like this? Um, it's actually uh, certainly not very clear. Okay, so I guess the... the <clears throat> The uh, next topic I want to talk a little bit about is the, uh, the capital market. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, actually, the, um, uh, the, the stock market started in 1990. Um, I guess the government, uh, the first bond issued is in 81, although it took a while 
for the government bond market to, to develop. And uh, <clears throat> so over the years, uh, both the uh, government bond market, the stock market, and also the corporate bond market uh, has enjoyed a fairly fast growth. Um, so here are some uh, numbers. Uh, <clears throat> the left panel shows the number of stocks listed on the two exchanges. The dark blue shows the number of stocks listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, uh, and the light blue is the uh, numbers of stocks listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. And what's kind of interesting is that you see sort of, you know, step function kind of growth in part actually is reflecting uh, government's policies in terms of controlling, uh, quote unquote, the growth or managing the growth of the stock market. And uh, the, the right hand side actually shows the market cap of these two uh, stock exchanges. Of course, the Shanghai Exchange in terms of the total market cap is still fairly largest. The fast growth in recent years actually is basically driven by the opening of two uh, exchanges, uh, <clears throat> uh, two boards actually at the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. One is for small and medium uh, companies and the other is for uh, sort of uh, startup companies. And uh, there's actually one important uh, reform I should mention. Actually when these um, shares were first created actually, uh, they were created as a way to raise uh, new funds for the state-owned enterprises. And should they issuing some of the shares for the new funds to their employees and uh, also to the public. The majority of the shares are actually still owned by the government. Okay, so that created this dual uh, class structure. The, the, the shares owned by the government are called the legal shares. Um, and the uh, ones that are issued to the general public are called floating shares. So early on, you can see that only a small part of the shares are floating, actually traded in the market. So in 2005, uh, actually they did sort of a, a conversion, uh, which made most of these shares uh, floating, and therefore they can be uh, traded in the market, available to, to investors. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is actually for uh, the government bonds. I've mentioned the, uh, the overall size at this point, um, and certainly we see a steady growth, and this is actually for the what's called the enterprise bonds. For bonds issued by companies in China, there are two kinds. Uh, the ones mostly issued by state-owned enterprises, uh, they're actually called enterprise bonds mostly, uh, and they have to go through a very strict uh, approval process. And only recently, actually, um, <clears throat> uh, companies um, can go through the issuance uh, process without going through uh, uh, formal approval, and it's called a registered form uh, corporate bonds. I will talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> but one thing is that actually, if you look at the total size of the corporate bond market, certainly it's grown quite a bit uh, in absolute uh, terms, but in terms of the scale, actually, it hasn't grown um, that much. <clears throat> One interesting thing to note is actually, uh, even though uh, the uh, corporate bonds um, are created actually to open up a cha new channel for firms to raise capital, but actually, if you look at uh, a large, uh, their ownership structure, actually, a large fraction of these corporate bonds are still owned by the banks. Okay, so in other words, this so-called market mechanism hasn't really, uh, I mean, certainly opened up that channel, but it hasn't really uh, <clears throat> uh, matured. So uh, what actually I want to mention a little bit, uh, kind of interesting fact about this market is its uh, total return over the years and also the risk. So what's plotted here is the green line, which is basically inflation um, from 1992, which is the beginning of the stock market years, and then to the end of um, <clears throat> 2015. And uh, this line is actually the cumulative return on large cap stocks, and uh, this line is on small cap stocks. So if you actually look at the overall market, the return, of course, is going to be dominated by the large cap returns. It barely beats the inflation. Okay, so that means that actually if invested in this market for 25 years, you haven't got much of a return. And this is a fairly big puzzle, uh, given the fact that China's total GDP has grown so much, the wealth has grown so much, okay? The other thing is that actually, I will report the numbers in just a second. If you look at the, actually the volatility uh, of the market, it's huge. On an annual basis, it's roughly 60 percentage points, okay? For the US market, for small cap stocks, the annual volatility is 30%. 
So here's a market with such a size, and then it's so volatile. Okay? <clears throat> and thus, of course, granted, this is only 25 years of data. You know, this, uh, we can quibble about the statistics, but nonetheless, actually, it is quite puzzling. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I, I think actually uh, my hypothesis, of course, it would be difficult to, uh, to really uh, uh, refute one way or the other is that actually when the Chinese government opened up the stock market, the main motivation is not necessary to actually develop a stock market so that actually uh, we will have an efficient price discovery process to determine the prices of these risky assets, but rather as an alternative to the banks to fund state-owned enterprises. Okay? So there is a very restrictive listing uh, process, and for years it's only the state-owned enterprises who can get listed there. So despite the fact that, you know, you have pretty poor returns, very high valuation, uh, and, and yet, you know, that's sort of where uh, uh, <clears throat> you can go. For retail investors, um, there's, you know, no many, not that many other places you can put your money in. You can put that in a bank, a very low interest rate, put the stock market, well, you know, with the hope that you can get some return, but uh, in reality, it's not obvious and yet you have to bear a, a lot of risk. Okay? So this actually is showing that the, the, so for annual returns for large stocks, you know, 60 percentage point, small stocks, 67 percentage point. So I think that it's really kind of puzzling uh, to uh, figure out you know, exactly why we're getting so low returns on these companies. And by the way, uh, it's not just for uh, <clears throat> state-owned enterprises. More recently, of course, private companies also enter this market. Um, if you look at their performance, it's not that impressive uh, either. So uh, it's something uh, interesting to, to explain as well. <clears throat> and the volatility is just uh, very, uh, uh, very high. There's a typical uh, <clears throat> hypothesis which basically says that uh, because China, China, the China stock market is mostly uh, populated by retail investors, and they're kind of the reason for such a high volatility. Uh, I'm actually questioning that. If we just retail investors, for them to move in the kind of a coordinated way, it's not that obvious. Uh, people say that Chinese investors like to gamble. Uh, but if you look at the volatility of the Taiwan market or Hong Kong market, it's 15, 20 percent. Right? So we don't see the kind of volatility as we see here. My hunch is actually this is a lot of it's actually driven by government interventions, despite the fact that actually the stated goal is to have a stable market. Uh, the reality is that uh, that doesn't seem to be working out that way. This is just uh, for U.S. comparison. You know, we certainly uh, <clears throat> are fairly familiar with that. Um, there's another thing I want to point to, and then actually I'll try to uh, uh, wrap up uh, <coughs> quickly, given the time constraint, and maybe we can have some time for discussions. Um, we also know that actually China has been trying to open up its capital account, uh, which is uh, uh, closed up to fairly recently, and there is some uh, uh, gradual opening. And uh, on sort of uh, ex-ante basis, you would think actually that makes perfect sense because you know the Chinese investors certainly would benefit a lot if they can allocate uh, wealth globally, and certainly uh, for global investors, uh, the Chinese. Uh, market could uh, look attractive. So if you look actually the correlation of the Chinese Asia market with other major markets, you know, that's actually a fairly no number. Um, so there's definitely um, substantial uh, diversification benefit. Except actually if you were to actually play this out, suppose actually you put uh, the Chinese market into the global baskets of stock markets and try to see what's going to happen. Uh, you will find out actually people are not going to invest too much in the Chinese market. Why? Because the volatility is so high, despite the fact that the correlation is less than 40%. Right? Um, so then if you go to the other side, this is actually for a Chinese investor. So this is where the Chinese market sits. This is where the other markets. Okay? And you, there will be a huge benefit to get your money out. So that's why the last few years, with this huge gap between global markets and local markets, both in terms of return and the risk characteristics, uh, this waterfall is just going to be very drastic. And, uh, and that's why, actually, uh, you know, as we uh, see that uh, after a uh, you know, large amount of capital outflow, uh, in a matter of a year and a half, 
the foreign reserve gets depleted by about a trillion dollars, right? starting from four trillion. So you know that was actually quite uh, quite scary, and of course uh, uh, they start uh, cutting that. Um, so this, uh, you know, I won't have time to get into sort of uh, the um, uh, discussion on the globalization of the Chinese market. Uh, this, in some sense, is kind of a dilemma the Chinese government has got into. Uh, if they try to open it up, uh, this capital flight actually will probably will be a very serious uh, risk, and certainly that will not be desirable. But to hold it like this, uh, certainly it's not <laughs> good for, uh, for citizens. Um, uh, in investors, and certainly it's not very good for the, uh, the economy uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, the only other thing I want to mention, actually, um, <clears throat> is uh, the uh, development of uh, the derivatives market. Um, and actually, um, <clears throat> the, the recent development in uh, the financial derivatives market actually started in 2000. Uh, 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 when they first opened up the, uh, the stock index futures. <clears throat> and it actually grew very fast. In a matter of uh, uh, six months, it actually became the second largest in terms of daily trading volume, uh, just next to CME. Okay? And yet, um, <clears throat> it actually uh, recently uh, it, uh, you know, suffered some serious feedbacks. I guess one particular scenario is actually in 2015, um, all of a sudden there's this, this huge roundup in the Chinese stock market. Uh, this is actually normalized index to one at the beginning of 2010, and the, the red is actually the Shanghai Stock Exchange, which is the largest one. The blue is the, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and then the green is the index for small and medium um, enterprises, and this is actually for the, the startup companies. Okay? And clearly, actually, we see this, this huge run-up, and uh, if you actually look at the <clears throat> Uh, the P ratio, uh, the valuation is just kind of unbelievable. Um, and uh, the, the, before actually the market actually crashed, uh, the government um, really used this as a vehicle to try to promote innovations and, uh, uh, and startups, um, <clears throat> uh, suggesting that actually this is just the beginning of a long time ball, except that actually in 2015, you know, the middle of that, uh, end of uh, June, uh, the market actually crashed. <clears throat> now, I want to uh, show what happened uh, <clears throat> when the market crashed. Uh, then there was a lot of actually blame on the stock index futures. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> basically saying that actually futures is the only place people can use to short the market. And actually, there was so much of it, actually, it was causing um, <clears throat> the stock market to, to drop. So in terms of what to do, the government basically imposed um, the following restriction. It cut the number of contracts you can trade for any account from unlimited amount to only 10 contracts. So basically, shut down the market with just a little, <laughs> a little air. Um, <clears throat> and, um, I actually, I remember I was talking to uh, the head of the, uh, the Financial Futures Exchange uh, you know, in that month, uh, and uh, they were very worried that actually the government would just shut down that market. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, it did not actually, uh, you know, recently it actually uh, recovered uh, somewhat. I think I'm using this example to also show that uh, here is a market where we know very well and it serves, uh, you know, very important uh, purposes, both from uh, the perspective of risk management and also price discovery, and yet um, <clears throat> uh, the government actually um, uh, is quite sort of unsure about exactly what to do with it, and uh, um, when they are doubt about uh, the potential quote unquote negative impact it might have, actually it took fairly fairly drastic uh, uh, measures um, to you know to intervene. Um, this actually is uh, another development about the bond market. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, up to until recently, most of the bonds are issued by state-owned enterprises, of course, with some kind of government uh, backing, and because of that, it has to go through a very uh, tedious uh, approval process. Um, <clears throat> starting actually 2008, actually, companies can register uh, 
the issuance with the uh, CSRC, which is the Chinese version of SEC, and then you know they can just uh, issue uh, subject to uh, certain uh, criteria. And uh, what happened is actually we see a very fast growth uh, in this market. It went from practically zero to uh, something like four trillion IMB, which is you know roughly eight hundred billion dollars in a matter of three four years. What's interesting, I didn't have the, uh, the, the particular data here, at least for uh, this. If you actually look at the investors in these bonds, they're all these bank, also these banks. So it seems like you could never really uh, uh, you know, get the, the, the financing away from uh, these entities with uh, you know, a lot of at least expectation about the implicit uh, government guarantee. Okay, so let me actually uh, try to uh, conclude. Um, <clears throat> certainly, uh, you know, with uh, some, you know, uh, examples uh, of data we have seen, we can see the fast growth uh, in the Chinese financial system over uh, this period. Uh, but it's fair to say that actually more of these growth is very much needed, both in terms of quantity, uh, but probably more importantly uh, in terms of quality. And uh, certainly, uh, given the uh, distortions in, uh, in the prices and also actually uh, capital is allocated, um, <clears throat> to have a more effective uh, financial system uh, would greatly improve uh, the allocation efficiency and also the social welfare. Uh, but probably it would also be very critical uh, for China to have to uh, try to reach this transition from a more of a uh, <clears throat> scale-driven uh, growth to a more sustainable growth model. I think in terms of uh, challenges, despite um, <clears throat> you know, uh, these uh, very substantial uh, uh, developments, uh, there are still uh, various uh, issues, as I mentioned, that actually goes often uh, not quite clear um, when things are going well. Actually, uh, the city goals to actually develop more of an efficient market to allocate or determine the allocation of resources. But you know, when things got a little rough, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, you will see uh, different uh, considerations uh, become uh, dominating. Uh, the boundaries between the government and the market is, uh, needs to be really uh, <clears throat> specified, no matter what that is. To have some clarity on that actually would always be good. I mentioned the fundamental reforms. Uh, that's challenging, this, uh, especially given the political system. Um, but nonetheless, I think that uh, in the long run, that's very much, uh, uh, that's very important. <clears throat> Uh, the coherent, the regulatory fr framework is uh, very uh, segmented. That's why actually when you see these developments, it's quite uneven. Uh, certain areas, maybe because of uh, more liberal policies, you will see very fast growth, but other parts are still very much uh, constrained. Then you will see actually these kind of distorted uh, <coughs> uh, growth, which may cause uh, new problems and push uh, the, uh, the development to slow down sometimes to uh, backtrack. And uh, how do we actually int uh, integrate the, uh, the Chinese uh, financial system into the global system, I think actually is um, also uh, a, a big challenge, uh, although uh, it's something I think that uh, needs to be done uh, <clears throat> uh, in a managed fashion, but nonetheless, um, you know, in, 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 a, uh, in a reasonable pay at a reasonable pace. Let me actually uh, stop here and then to see if we, you know, we have uh, further questions or, or discussions. Thank you. Okay, so for, uh, for these uh, <clears throat> uh, big state banks, I guess um, uh, in terms of the risk management system in place, um, on, I mean, I think that uh, on the face of it, actually, it looks reasonably sophisticated uh, because, it, you know, they would have to comply to uh, the Basel uh, requirements. Uh, and there are various uh, measures, macro-credential measures, the Chinese government have 
you know, instituted over the years, in particular after 2008. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, how seriously actually they are, you know, using that in conducting their, their business, uh, that actually, I mean, at least to me, uh, it's uh, not that obvious. Um, <clears throat> part of it is actually um, because, you know, over uh, this period, they have been enjoying this fairly stable kind of environment. I guess the only uh, uh, a point that's a little bit uh, unclear is actually 2015. The, it's true that the stock market dropped, you know, um, you know, roughly about 50 percent or so, but the Chinese market has seen bigger drops. Um, 2006 and 2007, it dropped 60 percent. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what's uh, uh, causing the government to actually to jump in uh, in all sorts of ways. I've shown what they did with the stock index futures. Uh, they actually inject a huge amount of money to, uh, to actually directly buy the stocks. Uh, and uh, I think a part of that is actually the, uh, during that period, starting actually from 2013, uh, the banks actually were some of it's through these <laughs> wealth management uh, products. Some actually through their margin lending, uh, which is kind of the scary part, actually. Banks uh, effectively lending money to you know, securities firms and so on to invest in these stocks. Um, talking to these uh, bankers, they say they are safe because you know, the, uh, the margin is 30%, basically. Uh, they think they are covered. Uh, but actually, I'm not totally sure that number is sort of what they report. I don't know uh, it's that the actual number. Um, so if that is in suspicion, then I, I will really have some question about how they're actually doing their risk management. Um, for these uh, you know, internet companies, uh, actually, frankly speaking, that is a very good question. It's very much a, a black box, uh, so, uh, because uh, these are all private entities. Uh, uh, government did give them a, quite a bit of leeway to develop these things when they get to such a large scale, and, and you would have to you know, ask questions about how robust their system is. If you talk to them, of course, you know, everything is so good and uh, they're hiring all kinds of top, you know, <laughs> computer scientists and so on to build these systems. But I, 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 I really uh, have some questions there. And especially given their size, I think that uh, it's fair for the government to at least to, you know, uh, try to put some uh, control uh, to that. Yes. I may follow up, and first of all, thank you. This has been a marvelous presentation. From the perspective of risk management, it's an immediate warning sign when there's tremendous growth in an organization because the organization outruns the capabilities of its people and its systems. To what extent and how is the Chinese government addressing that problem? Well, I think actually uh, <clears throat> for the, uh, um, as I mentioned, actually for the, uh, for this mobile uh, payment system, um, it's kind of interesting actually, instead of actually looking at this from a, a, systemic, a systemic risk perspective, although, you know, I mean, I think they have uh, instituted certain measures, for example, to require uh, these uh, payment companies to keep some reserves and so on, but uh, whether or not that's adequate, uh, who knows. Uh, but actually, the, the, the recent uh, uh, change to force these third-party payment systems to go through a central uh, clearing system, uh, the main motivation is actually for them to at least to see what's really going on, uh, more from a sort of an information perspective. That's the other thing that's kind of scary because uh, <laughs> these you know, uh, third-party payment companies, they actually know a lot more than what the central banks do in terms of who is doing what and how much. And, uh, you know, arguably, actually, that uh, could raise some, uh, some issues there. Um, so uh, that was sort of the mo main motivation, so that you have to go through this centralized system, so at least they sort of know what's going on. Um, <clears throat> whether or not they fully realize, actually, the potential uh, risk uh, behind this, uh, I actually, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, totally sure. Um, so uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, it would be uh, prudent <laughs> for them to really look more carefully into this. But as you know, I mean, this, you know, that's actually the other thing that uh, <clears throat> uh, it's uh, 
quite interesting from your comments. The, you, 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 if you go there, you talk to people, this idea of risk is actually is a very different uh, perception of that. Because if you look at the whole economy, if you look at sort of you do this as a one cycle, China for the most part has just gone through a quarter of it. You know, it hasn't really experienced this big downturn and maybe a recovery. So uh, a lot of this fast growth and so on, that seems to be the norm what people expect rather than worrying about, you know, uh, someday there will be a, a substantial drop. Um, and this is probably true uh, not just for companies, and, uh, but also for, uh, for financial institutions as well. Yes? China's macro policies seem to be a total seesaw. Uh, the real estate market gets overheated, so they tighten the economy. Slows, so they panic and loosen. The currency sinks. Uh, and they have capital flight, so they tighten and the currency goes up, which is where we are now. Right. But isn't there a good chance the economy slows and they tighten again? Do they ever get off this uh, apparent to an outsider, anyhow, seesaw? You know, I think actually uh, the, uh, <clears throat> in some sense, that's what, really, what I was mentioning, uh, they probably should have tried to figure out, you know, what. So what the goal is, and then you know, and then try to have a more consistent plan to uh, move in that direction. Of course, in terms of big goals, sometimes it's a little harder. Uh, but in terms of, let's say, for example, developing a well-functioning stock market, it seems like that's, uh, you know, if you want to have a market-driven economy, uh, you know, that's something that's very much needed. And yet, you know, <laughs> they would just kind of uh, do, you know, whatever. Sometimes they feel it's needed. Uh, um, and uh, certainly, I think that's very uh, uh, challenging. For example, 2015, this is a time when they tried to open up the capital account, both in terms of outflows and inflows. And yet, when the government does something like this, how do you expect, actually, international investors to, to move in? <laughs> um, it, it actually uh, certainly it would, wouldn't be consistent with something like, like, like that kind of goal. Maybe last, last oh, question. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. One of your early slides, thank you, that's if I need it. One of your early slides spoke about um, foreign investment either to or into China yeah, or from China. Yeah, actually from China outward. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so do, do they use that as a policy of investment? Like uh, Uganda invests 80% within the country, Japan invests 20% within the country. So is China doing that to, be, um, to diversify or does China use it as uh, political power to influence other countries? The, uh, you know, I think that the, that's a very good question. I know that there's actually different sort of perceptions on that. Um, I think actually a uh, large part of that, uh, in my view, actually, is through uh, private companies, some, uh, you know, state-owned companies as well. It's really just actually diversify okay. uh, globally because, you know, with the risk uh, within China, here we're talking about financial, but it's also political and so on. And, uh, of course, uh, if you open up the capital account, uh, you know, that's what, what you will see. Uh, unfortunately, I think actually for, for China to, for example, to open up the capital account to benefit the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, <clears throat> households, uh, what they should do is actually, rather than open up the account for firms to, you know, buy firms here, or hotels, or, you know, uh, vine vineyards, uh, what they should do is actually to allow uh, households some quarter to invest in secondary market which is the most efficient, transparent, and so on. Uh, rather, but, but they don't quite see it that way. Somehow, uh, the firms uh, manage to convince uh, the government that, that you know, the globalization is uh, very much needed, and so they actually get the uh, currency quotas, and they're doing this. And of course, that happened such, at such a fast pace that uh, they would just have to uh, you know, stop it. Sneak up here and say, um, Please join me in thanking Zhang again. I actually have to ask you, is this data from your data yearbook that you put together? Yes, so I think a big contribution you're seeing here is that I think a lot of this data wasn't very available, and I guess now it is. So thank you for that too, and um, thanks all of you. Um, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Good night. And thank you. <laughs>